All right, we are right here about 2.30, so we'll, I'll give us kind of a brief introduction here and then we'll get started. So I just want to welcome all of our attendees to our second uh, installment of Cafe Conversations. Uh, this one, well, first I'll introduce myself. I'm Elizabeth Vaughn. I'm uh, the Associate Senior Director of Philanthropy for the college. Um, and so today we have Dr. Will Snell, uh, Dr. Tim Woods, and Dr. Kenny Burdine, who are all extension faculty in our Ag Econ department in the college. And so they're going to talk a little bit about specifically the Ag Econ economy and how COVID has impacted that. So I'm going to turn it over. Uh, each one of them will kind of talk about their area of expertise. We did have some questions submitted in advance, but certainly if you have questions during the presentation, all of our attendees are on mute, but you can use the chat function to submit your questions. And we certainly encourage you to do that. Uh, and you can use that chat function as well. Um, just if you want to talk to each other, just uh, like you would a normal conversation. So without further ado, I think Dr. Snell is going to start us off. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Thank you, Beth. And good afternoon, everybody. It's certainly a pleasure to, to be a part of these conversations. Um, I'm one of our proud alums, been at the university, I guess, dating back 40 years ago as a student. I'm also honored to be on the Ag Alumni Board. And I was actually in Nashville getting ready for the SEC tournament and Ag Alumni event back in March when all this hit. And I don't think any of us in our wildest imaginations could have anticipated what we've all experienced. Um, certainly impacted every individual and, and most businesses out there. And needless to say, ag in the food sector has not been, uh, is not escaping. I think probably the, the Dean in your last, uh, or the inaugural cafe conversation kind of hit the nail on the head when she said, well, at least now people will learn to, uh, not to take the ag and food industry for granted. Uh, and when she made that statement, I actually, Beth, thought a little bit about my opening class that I have for, I teach a food and ag marketing class. It's uh, kind of better known as Dr. Mather's class. I think Dr. Mather is actually part of our audience out there today and been teaching that ever since Dr. Mather retired. But, you know, in the past, we typically would have ag students in that class who had an ag background and kind of knew about the ag industry and the food supply chain. But today's students, more, they're interested in food, interested in ag, but they really don't have a, a great understanding of the food supply chain. So one of the things that I do in the opening class is actually pull up a picture of downtown Chicago. And I set it at lunchtime and I tell the students, okay, imagine you're there and you're heading to lunch. And when you're heading into a restaurant, whether you're getting a hamburger or a salad or a sandwich or pizza, uh, you as a consumer expect that item to be available. Or when you go to the Kroger Field on a Saturday football game, or you go to Kroger to, to shop, uh, you anticipate and expect those items to be there. And I do this with a statement that one of my goals in this class is to make sure that students have a great appreciation of our food and ag marketing system, how complex it is. And we go through what it would take to get that salad, all those different ingredients or that hamburger to that little downtown cafe in Chicago or at Kroger Field and all the different hands it has to touch and all the different individuals that are part of it. And I have to admit, I, I go through this exercise and I think students somewhat you know, kind of glosses over them because, you know, they've expected those items always, they've always been there. You know, we may have a winter storm and a few things get uh, taken off the shelf, but for the most part, you know, today's students have seen a, a massive supply chain that has worked very well. But we all know that this has been different. Uh, most of the attention has certainly focused on consumers, the empty shelves that we've seen, the panic buying, uh, discussion of historic increases in food prices. We've changed how we get our food, uh, you know, where we buy our food and how it's delivered to us. So we all can relate to what's impacted, how it's impacted us as consumers. But for Kenny and Tim and I and many of our colleagues in the college that work with agricultural producers, 
it's hit our producers in a lot of different ways. Uh, Tim will actually talk some about some of the positive things that are going on, but Kenny and I deal a lot with a, a producer base out there. It's certainly been hit pretty hard. And it's never a good timing, but you know, all this is coming at a, a very challenging time because we've had three or four or five years of a tough farm economy. Uh, we've been able to kind of salvage a little bit of that in Kentucky because some of our producers have had some good yields and we've had some government payments to kind of weather the storm. But a lot of our producers out there have seen 30, 40, 50% drop in their farm income. So we're in in 2020 as a very critical year for a lot of our agricultural producers. And we actually had some optimism early on. We, you're all familiar with some of the trade deals that were passed and being negotiated. And, you know, I was actually on a uh, webinar with, with uh, Commissioner Quarles earlier this week, and we were talking about being in DC at an Outlook conference. And, you know, there were some positive attributes coming or feeling about agriculture for 2020. And the hope was we'd have some demand shock out there in the form of trade that would try to, you know, reignite the ag economy and, and get us uh, going in, in the right direction. So, you know, my comment is we had a demand shock and it wasn't trade, but instead it was COVID-19. It decimated uh, economies, not only here in the United States and jobs, but also worldwide. Um, you know, in the past, ag at times has somewhat been shielded from some downturns in the overall economy because we all eat. We may not buy that filet, we may switch to hamburger, we may not go out to eat as much, and we may buy you know, private labels. But, you know, if you look back at some times when the, ag econ the overall economy has, has been uh, struggling, you know, again, the, the food and ag markets have not been hit that hard. I always go back to the Great Recession, 2008 and 2009. If you look at commodity prices and look at food sales, yeah, a little bit of a downturn, but for the most part, we were able to hang in there. But, you know, this economic downturn has been different. For one, the downturn in the economy is much more severe here in 2020 than we experienced back in the Great Recession. I saw some data the other day that in its worst quarter in 2009, the overall economy dipped the largest percentage amount in 70 years. Our economy fell 2.5% during that one quarter. Well, those of you all that follow some of the economists right now, they're projecting that when the numbers come in for 2020, that for the second quarter, we may be seeing a 30 to 40% drop in GDP. So again, on the demand side, more of a, a negative impact. Obviously, we haven't gone out to eat that steak. We haven't, you know, we've been working at home. We haven't been buying gasoline, which affects the ethanol market, which affects our grain markets. So again, it's situation where on the demand side, ag has been hurt, but also on the supply side. We've had plenty of agricultural commodities available, but we've all seen the bottlenecks and seen on the national news. It's the fact that just because restaurants are shut down or plants are shut down, that uh, you know farmers have had to uh, plow under crops, or they've had to dump milk or euthanize um, you know, livestock out there just because of the supply chain. Um, in agriculture, it's not like a factory. It's not like it over in Toyota when the demand all of a sudden retracts that they can stop that assembly line. We can't tell that Holstein cow not to, to uh, produce that milk or that uh, you know, steer or pig that's ready for slaughter to, to go on a diet. Uh, we can't control the supply chain in agriculture like other sectors. So when you combine the pullback in demand and the bottlenecks on the supply side, what we've seen are ag prices down 10, 15, 20, 25 percent or more. Again, that compares with about a two and a half percent drop or increase in food prices. So it's been much more severe uh, for our agricultural producers out there. Um, as far as the ag economy here in Kentucky, as I kind of wind down my remarks, opening remarks, um, you know, Kenny and Tim and I and the rest of our colleagues anticipate we may do COVID lose about $500 million of sales. So it's about 10% of our farm sales. Um, 
So, you know, farmers are right now hoping to have a good growing season. Uh, we're being, again, supported by some government payments out there to, to try to, to limit the, the pain. But we all realize, you know, a good weather year, and depending upon government payments, is, you know, that's not always sustainable. So a lot of concern out there. I was on a session with some bankers earlier this week, and, you know, we've had some cash flow liquidity concerns, but the concern is what's going to happen to land values because that's been one of the factors that's been able to keep some of our, our uh, producers in the game just due to the fact that the bankers have been able to stick to them because on paper the balance sheets have, have looked pretty good. So that's one of our concerns. Obviously, we're hearing a lot every day about trade, uh, more protectionist attitude out there around the world. The value of the dollar is relatively high. Other economies are being impacted. A lot of trade tension. So that weighs heavily on a lot of our agricultural producers. But let me just finish with some opportunities out there. Um, you know, whenever you hit a crisis, you have those that, uh, you know, want to put their head in the sand and, and, and really worry. And certainly there's a lot of things to be concerned about, but there's people out there to try to take advantage of the situation. And then we've got a captive audience out there because everybody from policymakers to businesses to consumers are talking about food and ag markets. So uh, again, Tim is going to talk a lot about some of the positive things that's happened at the local level about how producers want local food. And a lot of discussion, Kenny's been in discussion with, uh, you know, trying to ramp up some of our processing at the local level and in uh, some of our uh, slaughter facilities, and, you know, some opportunities there. Been some discussion about concentration of markets, improving our supply chain, improving, you know, some of those processing plants that hopefully will allow consumers, not only here domestically, but worldwide to have confidence in the U.S. market. And then finally, I think it has created an opportunity for our college to shine during all this. Uh, our extension colleagues, at the, especially at the local level, have stepped up and just amazed every day the creative ways that are coming up with to keep our clientele engaged, informed, uh, somewhat calmed down, and, and ready to anticipate changes and, and just uh, to make it through these difficult times. So again, Beth, it's great to be with uh, a lot of my friends out there across the state and across the nation, and I look forward to the conversation as we move forward. Great. Thank you, Dr. Snow. Uh, Dr. Burdine, do you want to kind of jump in and give us an overview? Um, I think you focus a lot on cattle, and I know we had a lot of questions about the beef industry. Yeah, there have been a lot of things that have come up for sure. Um, I guess when I think about COVID-19 and livestock markets, it's almost been three phases. There was kind of the February phase, which looking back was really small. You know, it was focused on more or less how's it going to impact trade and exports into, you know, affected areas. And then the March impact to me was all about the demand shock. You know, the initial demand shock, layoffs, cancellations, decreased activity. And really, it's been hard to almost quantify just how significant so many of the, the so many of the shutdowns in the food service sector impacted the livestock market. So they, you know, that was kind of phase phase two, if you will, that was March, and then April and May, Beth, have been all about uh, supply chain disruption and you know processing plants having to shut down, pull back, you know, decrease at lower, or, you know, operate at lower capacity. But in perspective, um, at, at the bottom, um, both beef production and pork production were running about about 34% below 2019 levels. And that was at a time when we actually were gonna probably see larger production on both fronts. So that's that's pretty significant. You're talking about roughly a, a one third reduction in production of both beef and pork. Um, cattle prices and pork prices have been affected at the pro, uh, farm level too. Um, calves that we sold and, and the bottom, the, the worst point so far has been roughly about the end of April, first part of May. but calves off probably 100 125 dollars a head um, heavy feeders somewhere in the 125 to 175 a head range hogs i would say were down probably somewhere 30 to 50 dollars or so per head all those have rallied some since that bottom but certainly the cattle especially is still down quite a bit wholesale prices have increased and that's largely a largely a supply effect um there's just you know, there, we went through a phase where there's a whole lot less production out there and then Will mentioned retail prices. The, the retail price series is not, is not ideal. It, it, it lags a bit, and I don't know how much it really captures, but retail prices have been up some, but not as much as certainly we've seen at the wholesale level. 
But, you know, something I think very, very uh, telling is what we've seen retailers do. And a lot of them have put in quantity controls where you can only, you know, buy a certain number of packages of meat products. And, and, and that's a sign that if they weren't, if they don't raise their price, they're going to see that disappear. So that's a function of their expectation. So we've had this weird, this weird dynamic where you've got, you know, you've had this demand shock on that we've really been negative demand shock, but consumers on the same, at the same time, have not really seemed overly price sensitive at the retail level to meat price. So, you know, we've talked about, you know, you've, we've heard the, the term hoarding a lot. That's not the right term for me, but being with this buying ahead behavior, that's impacted sales. And then at the same time, we've, you know, we've certainly been combining that with a reduction in production because of the pullback. Um, leave with a couple of thoughts here at the end. Um, first of all, I'd say this, um, we really came into 2020 with some optimism and it was mostly, I think, trade related. Um, we were going to see larger production levels of beef and of pork and of chicken. Although the cow herd was actually a little bit smaller, it's really 2019 calf crop is 2020 beef production. So we were going to see pretty big production levels across the board. If you go back and look to in January and you know, have to kind of remind ourselves, unemployment was very low. So honestly, the sector was pretty vulnerable, I think, to a shock like this on the supply side. And the combination of a lot of animals to work through and, and a fairly tight market to begin with, I, I think really just kind of exasperated what we saw. So that's certainly been out there. Um, we've had both of those in place and it, it's, it's had an impact across the board. I think looking ahead to me, it really comes down to what happens as things start to reopen. You know, as restaurants reopen, as some states are reopening at a faster pace than others, and we're kind of watching what happens in those areas, I think that's going to dictate how quickly the other, the other areas open up, and that dictates how long these impacts persist. Great. Thank you so much. Dr. Woods, we'll turn over to you now, and you can bring us all the good news. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Uh, Sort of like Billy Goat to Gruff. I don't know if uh, it, it's a uh, you know everybody keeps thinking here's where all the good news is. It's it's mixed. Uh, you know where I work with, it's a lot of the specialty crops uh, in Kentucky, the uh, fruits, vegetables, uh, nursery crops. Uh, a lot of that is local production for local markets, uh, and one of the things that Dr. Snow was alluding to was just the uh, uh, idea of uh, resilience and responsiveness of our food supply system generally. And I think one of the things that has challenged our larger ag economy is that it's so driven by scale economies, uh, really large scale meat processing, really large scale uh, grain and other food processing, a very large scale distribution networks that are dedicated to the retail grocery sector or dedicated to the food service restaurant sector. And uh, a lot of the farm level production arrangements that are, are in place nationally are set up to, to accommodate those systems, those uh, large scale sourcing systems. And so when we had a, a situation in Florida, for example, where we would see large-scale produce operations just plowing under peppers and melons and, and uh, vegetables that they had there. Uh, it wasn't that people were not buying those products at grocery stores, but a lot of those folks had already pre-planted uh, and had contracts or dedicated arrangements with the large-scale uh, food service operations. And it's difficult at those really, really large scales to uh, make a quick pivot. Uh, the same thing in the meat processing, Kenny, right? You know, where uh, uh, whether it's uh, processing for chicken, it's headed to Dr. Woods, I think you're breaking up just a little bit there. It looks like we've lost 
audio. I think that's another one of the challenges we've seen out of COVID is everybody adjusting to Zoom and learning and our internet doesn't always work out the way we want. So we'll let Dr. Wood jump back on here. In the meantime, oh, looks like we've already got him back. So hopefully that, uh, sorry about that. that's all yeah. right. That happens these days. Oh, good grief. I'm so sorry. Uh, well, I'll just uh, uh, pull my points together in saying that we've seen uh, a couple of factors here that are played very much into the favor of a lot of our local producers and local markets. And that is consumers having uh, a much greater concern about security of where does their food come from and being able to access it and wanting good quality, fresh uh, product with local sourcing of all kinds, not just produce. Kenny, you can't hardly find a, an opportunity to buy a half a quarter of beef anywhere. We were on a call with some of our old fact sheet of how do you slaughter. It's gotten to this point here where people are really, really interested in this. And so CSA, uh, the Consumer Supported Agriculture Subscription Program, for example, huge growth in those. The people that are signing up for those programs, farms sold out like they never have before. Uh, even at our farmers markets where uh, the social distancing challenges and wanting to be mindful of uh, senior patrons and senior vendors, uh, those are way ahead of where they have been uh, from the previous year, already very early in the market season. But just because people are wanting to get access to better quality food, I think kind of uh, woven in there too is just the, the care about community, wanting to be around people uh, and wanting to be around good food. But, you know, the, the mixed message here is uh, a lot of those farm to whatever kinds of pro programs that we're talking about, think about farm to school, farm to restaurant, those just got uh, 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 crushed. Uh, you know, it's like flipping a switch and just the schools aren't buying those products anymore. We had uh, not, again, not huge scale or volume that was going into those markets. And so it was a little easier for our producers to pivot, but uh, we've had to make some adjustments in that space. Uh, we do see though, uh, for most of our retail ag uh, agriculture spaces, lots of growth, lots of opportunity, lots of innovation. You know, we have a lot of our folks doing uh, online stores and, uh, uh, house to house distribution uh, of ag products. And uh, as we've moved as a, uh, as a culture into this kind of online space, farmers are having to be savvy too on how do I be a player in that? How do I make my products available so that people can purchase those online and then plug that into a delivery system? So it's keeping us hopping on our extension uh, toes in terms of getting these tools out there, helping our farmers kind of learn on the go. And uh, again, I'd echo uh, what Will and Kenny would say just about what a great network of extension folks that we have out there uh, at our county offices that are just in the field, helping farmers innovate, helping farmers get information about the different programs, the federal programs that are available, uh, the state programs to help them manage through these crises. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a time where I'm really proud to be part of the College of Ag community. I agree with that. It's been impressive to see what our faculty, students, extension agents, everybody have jumped in and done. So and one of the areas, Dr. Wood, you kind of just touched on, and Dr. Burdon, this might be more a question for you, but kind of as along these lines, we had somebody submit, um, Jerry Goer submitted, are local meat processors able to ramp up production safely to offset some of this lost capacity that we're seeing at some of these large scale processors? Yes, yeah, so our local meat processors are running 24 seven. And you know, you talk to any of them, they'll tell you they're running as hard as they've ever ran. In fact, uh, uh, Dr. Woods mentioned this, but you know, if you wanted to get an animal processed at a local processor, you're looking, you're, you're gonna be looking at 2021 at this point. 
maybe even March 2021. So, so they have ramped up and, and, and they are going to offset some of that. But I think some is the key word. And to be honest with you, if you look at their capacity overall, it's still very small compared to total capacity for the U.S. as a whole. So they're going to offset some, but, but we've had a gap because many of those large processors have had to pull back. Yeah. Kind of, Dr. Wood, you also touched a little bit on the farmer's market and we had Peggy Powell submitted a question. How do you think the farmer's markets can reopen safely? And I think we've started to see some of these, but will you kind of talk about what some of the markets are doing? Sure. Sure. You know, they're, uh, they've been wrestling with this since, uh, early March and with some anticipation of what could this look like and what can we do and a lot of those farmers markets are necessarily very densely packed social functions and so uh, huge kudos out to folks like the Kentucky Department of Ag and Sharon Spencer and uh, Nancy Monroe and some of their staff that work with the farmers market community and some of our extension folks uh, the Community Farm Alliance many different organizations that are kind of on the ground working with folks to help set in place protocols that allow uh, our, our vendors to participate in these markets and to communicate out across uh, the 160 plus farmers markets that we have across the state. Here's how we're going to do it and it's going to involve uh, hand sanitizers and uh, extra distance between uh, the vendor and the patrons coming in, having one-way traffic flows. And they're a retail food space, just like you would see at a grocery store. So they have to be just mindful of how densely do we have a crowd of people there. Um, but they've work, come together, they've worked together and communicated very carefully. And, and so far, so good. We've had um, really good uh, feedback from how those uh, first interactions have taken place there at the markets. By and large, most Kentuckians seem to understand what we're dealing with here and are pretty patient with our, our producer vendor uh, community. And you know some things we can't do, like we haven't been able to offer sampling at the farmer's market, for example, and some of the other festival kinds of things or the arts and crafts kinds of things that are intentionally designed to bring more crowds. We've had to keep our foot off the pedal of those kinds of things initially. I think we will gradually feel our way forward through the summer, hopefully as uh, you know, we uh, hopefully are able to get more of this COVID uh, health crisis under control and figure out what we can and can't do. But so far the markets have done great, They're amazingly resilient. Fantastic. Well, Kind of jumping back a little bit to some of the livestock, we've had several questions submitted around pricing. Uh, one question wanting to know, since cattle prices are down for producers, but it seems that beef is up a little bit in the store. And then we had another qu question submitted uh, asking if we were seeing any evidence of price uh, manipulation in the meat market, or is that rise kind of just part of that supply demand interruption? Answered as best as I can, Beth. Uh, so the the first part of the question is that you know you're dealing with a processing bottle. You're dealing with a processing bottle. Understand what that does. By nature, what that means is you've got you've got less ability to move animals through the production system. So it, it creates a backlog of livestock, right? Which tends to put downward pressure on livestock price. At the same time, there's there's a negative supply impact. You've got less meat coming out the other. So the fact that livestock price drops and, and um, meat price goes up, unfortunately, is just a function of that processing bottleneck. And with it, I would add that you're, you're also combining that with this consumer behavior where folks are buying ahead. And granted, we've had, you know, we've had some negative, we've had some negative shocks on consumer incomes, but at the same time, through things like unemployment and through stimulus, we have kept consumers with some purchasing power. And they, again, they've not seemed very price sensitive at the retail level. So that's a recipe for rising meat price, and unfortunately, the backlog of, of livestock decrease in livestock price. The uh, the other piece of the question from Nathan there, you know, I, I don't do market power work, so I mean, I, I can't address specifically what we're seeing in terms of is there manipulation. The fact that there's divergence between meat price and livestock price, I think, makes sense. And granted, there's going to be investigation into that very topic. I'll be a spectator, kind of watching that. 
but I think the question is, is it beyond what we would have expected given what a normal market reaction would be? And that's what I simply don't know and hope the investigation will show. Somewhat similar, um, but it, I guess maybe asking for a projection here. Jim True submitted a question asking, when do you think live cattle prices will start to go up? And he's specifically interested in feeders weighing between five and 800 pounds at the farm. That's a pretty big range, Jim. <laughs> Glad you're watching. I miss seeing you, buddy. So I'm, I'm going to break into two pieces. I, I want to kind of separate them. So on the lower end of that range is calf price. And then on the upper end of that range is what I call heavy feeder cattle price. Um, our calf market typically is at its highest point in the spring. And frankly, I've been surprised that it's not come down any off of our grass demand highs. So that calf market, I honestly think, is probably at a pretty good level. It's realistically, it typically does seasonally, it's going to move down between now and fall. So I feel like our calf market is going to probably hold serve here in, in the spring or from spring to summer and then fall back in the fall like it typically does. The heavy feeder market is a little bit tougher to answer. Um, what COVID did with calves, in my opinion, it really took out our spring grass demand run. You know, we typically see calf price really rise in the spring as our stock operators place calves into grazing, grazing enterprises. And that's what we really didn't see this year. Calf prices didn't drop as much as they just simply didn't run up like they usually do. Our heavy feeder markets actually increased about 15 cents a pound in the last four to six weeks. So we've actually seen a pretty big improvement in those heavy feeder cattle prices. At the same time, what I'm weighing in the back of my mind is we've got this backlog of cattle. And if you look at feedlot placements and look at even Kentucky marketings, although things are picking up a little bit now, you know, we were running 20 to 30 percent below year ago levels, which means we've got some cattle to push through the system. So those heavy feeder cattle in a normal year hit their price peak sometime in August and September. And what I'm leaning toward, and I always kind of tell folks when I get this question in the county meeting, there's always the slight chance I could be wrong here, right? I'm kind of speculating. But what I think we'll see is I think we won't see that run up we usually see in August, September and we'll see a fairly flat uh, heavy feeder cattle market between now and fall. That would be my guess, Jim. Great, thank you. So Dr. Snell, I'm gonna, I think this is probably more of a question for you, but kind of switching gears a little bit into the soybean market, you know, typically we have sold a lot of soybeans internationally, in particular to China, and that had fallen off a little bit, but do you think that we will ever be back to a point where China is buying enough of our soybeans to substantially increase the price? And that's John Raglan asking that. If you look at the uh, soybean market, as you pointed out correctly, Beth, it's been very trade dependent. Um, you know, a number that's often thrown out is about half of our soybeans end up being exported and in its heyday, we about three out of every 10 bushels of soybeans that we produced would end up in China. And a lot of that, as Kenny would tell you, is just due to their love of pork. Uh, China consumes about half of the world's pork. Uh, so we initially sent a lot of beans over there to, to meet that demand in terms of feed. Um, but then the African swine fever hit and had a big impact on pork supply in China and the demand for beans and then you you know put the tariff and trade war on top of it that's where we saw a substantial drop in uh, soybean exports to uh, to China. Now we were able to in 2019 actually to move some of those beans to other markets but there's no doubt that it had you know that loss and reduction in China had an impact on price. We had the phase one trade deal that came about in uh, January that created a lot of optimism out there. Same time, you know, China is trying to repopulate their, uh, their pork supplies, or their hogs, and that's moving on somewhat slowly. So I don't think initially, even with the, uh, the phase one trade deal, that that alone, given their demand for, for soybeans to feed their hogs, and give their hog inventories to do what's going to allow that to, to rebound quickly. I think long term, and maybe Kenny can jump in here, that we probably have more ability to see an impact on our grains through moving more meat in international markets than we do seeing grain moving directly. 
So again, maybe I'll ask Kenny to, to offer his thoughts on that. I would agree with the last part of that for sure. You know, the, the, the growth in meat markets more recently has been on the international side. You know, we're a fairly mature economy in the United States, right? And, you know, a lot of the countries that we're exporting to are, are developing as we speak. And, and the, middle, the middle class that we refer to is increasing. And as that happens, they add more protein to their diet. And we're seeing that in a lot of places. So, so I think Will's point is that we may see that as, as that continues, it'll create more demand for, for feed grains that'll be fed to livestock for export purposes. And I would definitely agree. We had a couple of questions submitted. Um, Lincoln Martin and Gil Mathis both submitted questions just kind of on your overall thoughts and projections in respect to the long run forecast kind of across the commodity market. So looking, I guess, a little bit more holistically, corn, wheat, and soybeans combined. Well, I'll jump in there. Um, the short answer, I think on that is without a supply shock, uh, cream prices are going to be depressed for the immediate future. We, uh, it's kind of interesting on the way in this morning, uh, I saw $1.99 gas. Now, a few years ago, we would have been elated to see $1.99 per gallon gas, but my comment to my wife was, well, that's good news. She says, how come that's good news? And I said, well, that means, you know, the economy is rebounding somewhat. But, uh, you know, so much of, on the corn side, 35% or so of our corn goes to ethanol. And, you know, it's just been hit so hard with us driving so few miles these days. And even though maybe we'll see some increased travel activity in the months to come as we hopefully get COVID under control, I think it's going to be a challenge to, uh, you know, get that ethanol production back to the level that, you know, we've seen in the past, just due to our change in the energy market. Uh, the other grains, you know, again, so trade dependent, and uh, we had some optimism there with uh, a trade deal with, uh, with China. It remains to be seen what that will be fulfilled. Uh, USMCA didn't necessarily give us a boost in overall trade demand, but at least uh, I think kept us at the levels that we had in, in previous years. And there's some discussions right now with the United Kingdom as well as the European Union and, and Japan. So, again, I think a lot of the long-term outlook on the, the, uh, the green side is going to be very, very much trade dependent. And then we had another question submitted kind of along these same lines with uh, that Shad Baker had submitted asking about the impacts of COVID on timber sales. Can you talk a little bit about what we've seen in regards to timber? Yeah, we were actually on a call with county agents. I guess Kenny was yesterday and that question came up. Uh, so I'd actually talked to Jeff Stringer, our uh, chair of our forestry department a few days ago. And forestry, even though we think it's much different than traditional ag, has had a lot of the same problems. Uh, they were caught right in the middle of the trade war. And while our producers got some compensation through trade assistance payments, you know, the, the forestry sector did not get those, those benefits. They just lost a lot of trade. So again, there was some hope at the beginning of the year that we would see some rebounding in timber prices because of, of increased trade activity. But on top of that now, we've got the slowdown in the U.S. economy and so much to that sector is so dependent upon housing starts and construction. And uh, I know, Tim, you deal with this space a whole lot, dealing with the nursery industry. Uh, it's so dependent upon, you know, the general economy. And, you know, uh, Jeff's comment to me was that right now timber prices are really you know, taking a hit. You specifically mentioned red oak, which is so important to, to uh, many of our landowners out there. And, you know, his advice right now is just hold tight if you can, and uh, hopefully we'll see an improvement in the economy and the, the trade will pick up. But, uh, again, I, you know, Kenny mentioned the supply chain. We've got the same backlog right now on the timber sector as well. So, Maybe, Tim, you want to talk a little bit from a nursery standpoint? Yeah, I, I mean, you're exactly right. The, the housing start deal, uh, the early forecast looking into the housing starts, which do tend to run cyclically through the year, uh, where we should be seeing a huge surge in housing starts right now, nationally and even in Kentucky, it's way, way down. And so 
the timber processing, uh, all those kinds of products that go into home construction, even in spite of some of the efforts to lower uh, lending rates, mortgage rates, uh, still crazy low, uh, but people are just really, really skittish about making big investments right now. And I think it's just as consumers being very, very uh, conservative and cautious, it's, it's, and it's understandable uh, until there's some sort of normalcy or uh, uh, security. And you know, one of the things we haven't really talked about too much here yet is uh, how is this going to play out longer term in our economy and in terms of the recession, in terms of consumer spending, uh, and how does that impact not just things like uh, housing and capital purchases like that, but other kinds of uh, consumer products that many of our ag products are indirect inputs into those things. Uh, you know, how is that gonna, how is this going to impact uh, eating out at restaurants and just how, uh, you know, still a lot of uncertainty in our unemployment sector. You know, I remember seeing news out of Louisville when the COVID deal first hit back in March that all of a sudden 25,000 food service workers were laid off. Uh, you know, that's a, that, that was a huge hit. And, and still kind of just now starting to creep back to where they're hiring some of those folks uh, back. But, you know, those people are spending money in our economy otherwise. And even with some of the efforts to try to provide the unemployment insurance and coverage and uh, the very stimulus efforts, those are super short term stopgap uh, efforts, I think, in turn. So we're, we're all kind of watching, you know, I think as economists, particularly watching to see how this is going to play out in uh, kind of a wider economic impact in terms of consumer spending and opportunities. Yeah, just in my space and dealing with the policy arena, obviously a lot of money is being, you know, pushed out by the federal government to support businesses and individuals as well as farmers. But what does all this mean you know, three, five years down the road in dealing with the, the debt and, you know, funding for Farm Bill and, and other food assistance programs. Uh, tough choices ahead, but, you know, in the short term, you, we, we've got to try to get this economy re, reignited. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the questions that was submitted, which obviously in our state is, we focus on this industry maybe more so than any other state, but the overall outlook for the equine industry for the next two to three years, can you guys kind of talk about what that looks like? I know right now, like so many others, it's pretty rough, but what do you see long term? I'll take the first stab at it. Anybody else feel free to jump in, of course, but um, unfortunately, I don't see any way that it won't be impacted, you know, negatively by what we've seen. Um, you know, it, the, in, the equine sector was hit relatively hard with the recession of 2008-2009. You know, in this particular case, you know, we've seen an impact on racing already. You know, that has an impact on, on sales, and then that has an impact on stud fees, right? So all of those things kind of fit together. You know, I think it is fortunate maybe that this hit in the – when it did, I think it might even had a bigger impact on the equine sector had it happened in the fall. You know, it's really your, your fall yearling sales and your – your late fall, early winter breeding stock sales where most of your most of your equine revenues come from for a lot of operations. Don't tell the Kentucky Derby folks that, Ken. <laughs> well, uh, sales and revenue, Tim. Sales and revenue, not so much. Hey, it's Farm coming in September. Sales. Yeah, um, exactly, exactly. Um, but, you know, as you think about it, there, there's also a lot of influence of foreign dollars into the equine sector as well, right? And all of that comes into play. So, it honestly, from, from my perspective, looking at cash receipts and, you know, value of horses and sales and so forth. So I'm, I'm talking farm level admittedly, but it took, I thought it took the equine sector two, three years to, to climb out of the impact of the 08, 09 recession. Now this one's going to be different. I think it's going to be a sharper, a, a sharp, a steeper drop. I think the question comes down to how quickly that recovery occurs. Um, and I think that'll impact how long, but, but I definitely think there'll be a pretty sizable impact there as well. And I'll 
just add, uh, you know, we focus so much on the racing and the, the uh, horse owners themselves and the horse farms, but, you know, I wonder what impact it has on real estate values here in, in central Kentucky. And also the equine industry is so connected with, uh, you know, so many other sideline businesses from the equine hospitals to uh, uh, tourism, yep. tourism uh, you know, agribusiness sales. So it's a big trickling down effect uh, just beyond the, the racetrack and the, and the farms themselves. Yeah, absolutely. I'm shifting gears a little bit here to kind of go back, you know, Dr. Snell, you mentioned a little bit of policy. And so we do have some questions about some different policy pieces that have been put into place. And so one of our questions that was submitted, 60 Minutes had aired a segment a few weeks ago about federal funds that are available to farm owners right now. Could you talk about who's eligible and maybe how they get access to that money? Yeah, I heard about the 60 minute piece. I didn't watch. It seems like what I heard, it was a lot to do with the controversy of who gets those payments, the small versus large farms, uh, which is, you know, been an ongoing discussion ever since the development of, of ag policy. Uh, right now, our farmers primarily, in the past, or I guess in the past couple of years, been eligible for three pots of money. They had the farm bill money that uh, basically supports, you know, income of uh, mainly crop farmers and some conservation programs. Then we had some trade assistance payments called you know, MFP market facilitation program payments that were due to the trade war. And then more recently with the uh, coronavirus and stimulus, the CARES Act provided some funding it's called CFAF. It's Coronas, Coronavirus Food Assistant Program, which provides uh, not only food or USDA buying food and delivering some of that to some of our food banks, but also some direct payments to producers out there. Uh, for the most part, most of these programs have been designed to provide the dollars based upon the size of production as well as the risk that you take. So, con you know, again, a controversial piece has been, and I think the 60 minute piece was focusing upon this, that most of the payments have gone to the larger farmers. And, you know, there's no doubt there's some small farmer programs out there, all the way from the farm mill programs and some of our agents have, you know, developed extension programs on beginning farmer programs. There's some low interest rate money available through, uh, the Farm Service Agency, the Governor's Office of Ag Policy has Kentucky Ag Finance Corporation working with, uh, you know, small and beginning farmers. Uh, so again, it's been an ongoing debate. There's, there are several different pots of money out there. And uh, again, some of my concerns are, you know, this is provide a, a Band-Aid to get us through these times. But one is it's probably not sustainable. And two, what happens when, when these dollars you know, go away. So uh, long answer to say, you know, most of these programs are administered through the Farm Service Agency. So just would inform our audience to, you know, check with uh, FSA to uh, see about eligibility and, and uh, sign up uh, applications. So if Kenny or Tim, you, Tim, you work a lot with some of the uh, uh, smaller producers, um, some of the specialty crop producers and different pots of money out there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just as you say, there is a lot of hand-wringing over uh, how do we get access to this, and it seems like you've got the bigger players are at the table sooner with more access and capacity to even be able to go after funding that very quickly seems to dry up, and that's it. It's just been a very difficult environment, uh, politically, administratively, uh, to bring kind of equal aid and support uh, out to people. Uh, you know, I think programs like, I, I, as I've worked with some of our smaller scale producers, mm -hmm. I know many of them have at least figured out how to take advantage of things like the uh, payroll protection program where they've got employees that are in place. Uh, and so, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would just echo kind of what you said. We've had just great support with our local farm service agency. They've worked closely with our many of our extension offices and others uh, in the state that are really trying to help farmers navigate what am I qualified for, how do I get through, what documents or paperwork needs to get uh, navigated. And in defense of a lot of uh, these programs that are put out, they've actually tried hard, I think, to minimize onerous application processes. So they're, they're generally easier relative to some other farm assistance programs. But your advice is, is perfect. Contact your local FSA office and if you've got questions at all about any of those, and, uh, see where you can potentially get some help. We had Trish Sargent submitted a question kind of asking about some of those uh, smaller farm programs. And so I think you guys have addressed a lot of that. But then she went on to ask, how can the general non-farming public help the farmer? Well, a lot of ways out there. You know, we've had this local food movement and I know a lot of our consumers that realize the importance of keeping those dollars locally. Um, so they've supported everything from uh, the CSAs to the farmer's markets, the direct marketing. Uh, you know, another thing that, uh, you know, kind of plays in line with this, some of the indirect effects of COVID with uh, consumers wanting local products is to, you know, approach those national retailers and, in, you know, demand local foods. Um, you know, work with our policymakers on the state and federal level to support programs to, uh, you know, benefit agriculture, to benefit, you know, agribusinesses, even certainly our college through our extension work. So uh, we need all the help we can get. Um, and, you know, we live in a state that's very blessed with such great rural communities and so dependent upon supporting those local producers and businesses. So that would be my, my advice. Looks like Emily Spencer submitted a question here asking, are you all aware of any policy or regulatory obstacles that producers have faced in relation to any changes they've had to make or are trying to make because of COVID? Well, one that quickly comes to mind early on, there was some concerns about labor supplies coming in from uh, uh, primarily from Mexico as they closed the consulate offices. And I think, in fact, they may still be closed, but for the most part, I think we've been able to get the labor here. Um, you know, there's been a lot of questions about some of the challenges we face with this labor supply because when Tim, when uh, that harvest is ready, you know, we can't have to, to quarantine our workers. Um, you know, I think we can socially distance and have hand washing stations and some of the CDC rigs in the field, but, you know, an issue from the labor front has been a lot of these uh, individuals travel together and live, live together in various housing units. So that makes us very vulnerable to, to some of the, uh, you know, government uh, enacted provisions to, to slow down the spread. So I think on the labor perspective, one comes to mind, and I don't know if you all have other items. I mean, there's so many, so many potential pieces. I mean, you've got all the uh, kind of regulations. I know in the direct marketing space of what can I sell, where can I sell, uh, you know, what markets are going to be open. Uh, I really have been impressed with our institutions here in Kentucky in terms of communicating, uh, here's how we're going to do it uh, in terms of opening markets. Here are the protocols that we're going to follow. Here are the expectations we have from vendors. Here are the signage support uh, that's, that's been put out there. Uh, uh, the uh, food safety branch, the KDA, uh, all those folks pitching in, working with our extension folks on trying to communicate to people, here are, uh, here are the paths that we're gonna move forward. And 
I mean, face it, we're in a situation right now where nobody really knows exactly how to move forward. What, you know, we're all brilliant 2020 hindsight, uh, but, uh, you know, the moving forward is still a lot of uncertainty out there. And so just encourage folks to kind of be patient as policymakers, uh, for the most part, really are trying to give a good faith effort to try to move us all forward in a, in a positive way, a safe way, healthy way, uh, where we can all come out uh, uh, safely on the other side of this. So we received a question from Lynn Pruitt um, and asking, that processors have received a bonus from the USDA for each animal that they process. Uh, you know, apparently lambs, you get a $50 bonus for the processor, but the farmer under the CFAP program receives only $7 per lamb. So can you all talk about maybe why they've chosen to maybe slant some of that relief a little bit more towards the processors and not necessarily the producers and then also is, do you see this COVID crisis maybe as an opportunity to highlight sometimes the farmer seems to be getting the smallest sliver of the revenue and what they're producing? Is this, does this give us a chance to look at that and maybe change it or at least bring awareness to it? Let me start and then I'm going to see if anybody else wants to jump in because I, so full transparency, I don't honestly know the USDA program that is incentivizing production. I wonder, is there any chance, is there any chance he's referring to the program that Bank Development Board has just started, yeah. which is to incentivize local processing? Is, is that, is anybody? That's the first part of it, yes. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So let's separate the two then. So the CFAT program is intended to help compensate producers for a portion of market loss as a result of COVID-19. So, you know, she mentioned lamb, there's, there's payments in there for hogs, payments for cattle. And they were pretty transparent about how they arrived at that. Um, you know, that they weren't intended to make producers whole, but certainly ones that sold in the 90 day window that they looked at on the livestock side were, were compensated to some degree. Um, now the other piece and, and what that, what that is, and it was done by voting board, I think at this past, this past meeting, but, they've put in some different incentives to try and increase local process capacity. So on, on one end, it's things like investments to increase capacity long run and, you know, add new equipment, cooler space. I think what she's referring to is what they call phase one, which is actually an incentive payment for process, local processors to, to process more animals than they did in according uh, from some sort of baseline, maybe last year or something like that. So I think that really is aimed more at trying to get more of these um, local uh, local animals pushed through our local processors so we can reach more direct consumer markets. Feel free to chime in, colleagues. I don't have much really to add, add to that. I do know, uh, you know, we talk about CFAP. Uh, there's some additional dollars that potentially uh, could come down the road. This may not be the only pot that Secretary of Ag has indicated. There's some parts of the, the current stimulus package for Ag that uh, maybe left out certain sectors. So uh, for good or for bad, there may be some additional programs down the road uh, to try to address some of these inequities that are out there. Along the inequity line, but I guess maybe slightly different. So obviously Kentucky, we have a very rural population uh, through a lot of the state. And we know that some parts of the state lack high speed internet and cell phone access. So are there programs that you all know of that are working specifically to help farmers that are in those communities where, you know, obviously we've seen this huge shift to a reliance on internet connectivity, you know, since COVID broke out. Is there anything that you know of that's in place to help, and maybe not even just farmers, but across the board, connect those areas a little bit more and, you know, get them kind of in tune with some of these e-commerce and some of these other platforms that are happening? I'll start off with you. Go ahead, Will. And ask Tim and, and Kenny to jump in. Uh, I think policymakers 
realized even before COVID-19 came about the importance of broadband and, and rural connectivity and just this challenge that our rural areas have in staying uh, a vibrant component of this uh, high-tech connected global economy out there without access to, to good internet service and cell phone service. And now with you know everything from telemedicine to classes to all these Zoom meetings we're on working at home, it's just elevated the importance of this. So I do know, you know, there's been some dollars put in the farm bill for rural development programs. And I think there's been a couple of rural development packages and been some discussion about a bipartisan infrastructure bill moving forward. Um, you know, for somebody that didn't work in this space, we hear, you know, I hear a lot of about it. I don't know about if dollars are adequate, but it seems like we all continue to hear that a lot of our rural areas are challenged with lack of connectivity, which again, I think uh, we can talk a lot of programs out there, fellas, in terms of importance, but there's probably nothing more important than, than being able to be uh, connected with the global economy out there. So I don't know what the answer is, and if my colleagues have any addition. Yeah, I, don't, I don't have any brilliant insight in terms of somebody showing up with wheelbarrows full of gold to suddenly make it happen. It's Broadband is a very, very expensive infrastructure. And, and especially if you meet it out into a investment per capita, uh, that's the challenge right, that we face in terms of trying to get the very best, latest, fastest uh, technology out to our rural communities. Uh, the public cost is enormous. Uh, but just as Dr. Snell is saying there, uh, we all recognize how important that is. And, uh, you know, we do a lot of training through extension on how to help producers develop these, as I mentioned before, these kind of online markets and uh, do the social media kinds of things that help them to connect in these local products to local markets. Uh, I, I can say that I'm impressed with the uh, uh, efforts and innovation that a lot of our rural farmers have been able to uh, do to get their presence up in these markets. Uh, but I, I, you know, the question is a really good one. And I think it's one that even in our role in extension, uh, how can we try to help folks find effective, cost-effective ways to be able to do that uh, engagement better? You know, it's, it's, market information is going to be just so critical going forward and consumer engagement and market engagement to be able to make real-time marketing decisions uh, is going to be uh, just critical uh, going forward. And I think that's going to be an important part of our role in the college and an extension kind of looking forward these next few years. We have hit 3.30, which is, we said we would only take an hour, so we can kind of start to wrap things up here. I certainly, we do have a few more questions that were submitted. I don't know if you all want to take any more or we want to go ahead and kind of wrap things up. Do you all want one or two more? Sure. All right, we'll go on with a couple I'll more. I'll take Kenny and, and Tim, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I, if any of our attendees need to jump off, I totally understand. We will send out a recording of this after the fact. So if anybody misses these, don't worry, we'll send that out and you can catch those later. So kind of pulling back a little bit and looking more broad scale, we had a question submitted just asking about what's the impact of COVID-19 on the ag economy affecting other areas of the world? So specifically looking Latin America and Africa, how has this impacted those economies? Well, we've, we've talked about the impact on commodity prices here in the United States. And, you know, we, we're part of a global economy out there. And when prices fall here, they, they fall worldwide. And what are we doing here in the United States to support our farmers? We're, we're throwing billions of dollars in government support. And, you know, a lot of our developing countries where agricultural and farming is, is a much greater importance to their overall economy that they don't have access and the ability to support their their farmers through uh, you know government assistance so uh, 
you know, it, it's, it's very sad. This look, I think, at the outcome, not only for our competing producers out there, but for consumers as a whole, because I think one of the outcomes of all this challenge that we face, not only a loss of farmers here in the United States, but worldwide, but I mean, Kenny the, the, and Tim, the, the price of food, we're so blessed in this country for it to be so low, but the, even in this country, the price of food is gonna have to go up as we change our processing facilities and uh, change how we uh, deliver products to the consumer. Um, you know, that's what I see as one of the unfortunate consequences of, of this this outbreak. Is that producers are going to be hurt long term, and consumers are going to pay more for food. And I think one, we would all recognize. I think that uh, one of the things this whole COVID disruption underscores in a huge way is just what a global economy and global community that we're in. And whether it's markets that we're selling to as uh, an agricultural community, or just trying to get our our social systems around a way of dealing with the health challenges together, and, and looking together for solutions of whether it's uh, 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 vaccines or other kinds of uh, healthcare interventions. It's, it's a global problem that has affected all of us. And, you know, it's, it's a tragedy and there's, there's no way to sort of back away from that reality uh, of what we've had to, had to suffer through. Real people have, have suffered really a tragic loss uh, in the middle of all this. And, you know, we can talk as economists about programs and financial support and things, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's something that I think is going to leave a scar on not just our country, but really on the world uh, for a very long time. And, uh, you know, just, we are, I think the best that we can hope for here is that we're able to identify a vaccine, identify some ways to uh, kind of at least mitigate some of the uh, wide reaching healthcare uh, impacts there. That ultimately is the most important uh, thing is finding a way to deal with that side of it. One quick comment I'll add to it. Um, following the chat here, Joe Kane made a point that another big wild card is will we see another, will we see another outbreak? Oh, and that's a really good point. And one observation, I deal in livestock markets and a question came up a few weeks ago on a webinar that I was involved with about, you know, why have, why have, uh, how, why have beef products been impacted more so than dairy products? And, a lot of the answer is because a lot of our meat processing is still very, it's still very people labor driven, right? You've got folks in fairly tight confined spaces that are, you know, doing a lot of manual type labor. And, you know, plants have put a lot of things in process to try and deal with that. You've, you know, they've slowed lines down, they've spaced people out. You've even seen some that have put in, you know, glass dividers between folks. But it'll be interesting if, if we do see more of this or if the industry perceives this as being a longer term impact will we move towards some more automated, you know, processes within some of our more typically labor driven production? Great, thank you all. Kind of our next, and this will be our last question, but kind of does deal with if, you know, we do have this resurgence, you know, we've seen some furloughs already in packing houses, you know, we've, we've seen challenges or in processing plants, I should say, you know, and so we've seen some of those challenges. And as we do start to see more and more, particularly like horticulture crops getting ready, that's, you know, very labor intensive. We're still picking lots of berries and fruits and things by hand. Do you all, what do you see that impact maybe in the next, and maybe just the, the question is if it comes back or not, but what do you see over the next, six to 12 months in terms of the labor supply and how, uh, you know, do we see more furloughs? Do we anticipate that? Do we see that being a bigger challenge than it's already been? That's such a huge question. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine it being a bigger challenge than what we've gone through 
it's because it's just been so momentous. Uh, but, you know, I think that's a reality that we have to brace for and prepare ourselves for. And I think, I think there has been some learning, some important learning that has taken place as a, as a society and as a, a, a food and agricultural production system uh, that is allowing us to uh, think about how to approach this issue in the event that there is uh, another outbreak, uh, for example. Uh, but, you know, I think, I think most of the changes that we're going to see really are going to take still, still a few years to really get in place. You know, Kenny's mentioning the automation and some of these new tech, uh, labor saving technologies and uh, whether it's packaging or distribution of our food or uh, other sort of aspects of how our supply chain uh, adapts. Uh, I think it's still going to take a few years to implement um, some of those more substantial changes, but some of those things are here to say are here to stay. The uh, ordering online uh, at your grocery store, at your restaurant, uh, uh, you know, I think those are things that that we've just sort of gotten used to, and I don't see us turning back. Maybe you guys have some other uh, thoughts on that. No, I think there's a lot of truth in that. And I guess the only thing I would add is to give some credit to our food system. I think we've done a pretty good job adjusting as well as we could. You know, in a lot of ways, you know, Tim alluded to how difficult it is for a processor that's geared up towards food service outlets to automatically just shift gears and, and move towards at home consumption. That, that's not easily done, right? at all and we, we've had to do that and now by the way we're starting to shift back as we we're seeing food service pick back up right so you know there's, there's this constant thing i mentioned that production of both beef and pork were down 34 percent at the bottom and that bottom was i guess I can't remember end of april i think maybe first of may but you know last week uh they were down six and eight percent respectively so put that in perspective we have really ramped up production a lot and the other thing that I'll point out is if you look at how far production was down, it was down way, it was down quite a bit more than just the volume or the capacity of the plants that were totally shut down. So what that tells me is the plants that were operating understood they had to do things differently. They had to do things to protect workers, you know, to, they had to put in some things that frankly cost them money, right? And decrease their output, right? But I think they felt like that was the right thing to do and this sort of thing to do for the longer term, greater, greater benefit of the whole food system. So I, I would just say that we did do a pretty good job. And generally speaking, the second time we deal with something, we deal with it a little bit better. So I, I do think we learned a lot from this. So if the next outbreak is not a whole lot worse, you know, hopefully we won't see quite as severe an impact. Somewhat of a miscellany maybe, but hope so. I'll just echo both my colleagues there. I had a media call the other day and wanted to talk about the, the broken food supply system. It's like, it's not broken, it got disrupted. I mean, we may not have found every item we wanted to at the grocery store or had to adjust the way we bought food, but uh, we, uh, you know, again, very fortunate in this country to have the food supply chain that we have. It's uh, been interesting to see all the similar, uh, the comparisons back to World War II and what the Europeans went through. And, you know, th those were some, some difficult times. Uh, even was watching a documentary the other night about the Civil War and was talking about uh, one of the things that enabled the North eventually to, to win is they cut off that, the supply chain and the food supply chain. I mean, that was one of the, the big issues. So we've had some disruptions, but uh, this is a, a very, like I started my opening remarks, I want my students and I think the general public to realize how complex, how efficient, how, um, you know, just the, we're very fortunate to live in this country with the food distribution system we have. We're going to have to make changes, and I agree with Tim. Some of these changes are, are going to stick long term, but uh, I'm confident with when and if uh, another wave comes, it will uh, tackle a lot better than this time, and, and we'll make it through. So let's end up on a positive note. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate your all's time today, and thank you to all of our attendees that joined in. We are continuing these cafe conversations throughout the next few months. Uh, since we can't be in person with people, we're trying to bring the college 
uh, to everybody in a maybe a new and unique kind of way. And so we are working on our next uh, installment. And so I would say just watch your email and you'll get more information about that. Um, and again, we'll send this out, the recording out to everybody. So if you missed any parts, you can check it out on the recording. And thanks everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, Beth. Thanks.